to catch everybody up and uh, then we'll move forward uh, with recapping what we've just done and we'll get it all done tonight you know we will <laughs> uh, Peggy if I could ask you to turn the main volume up on, on this mouthpiece it'll be, be on the far right on that okay tell me when it's loud enough for you guys How's that sound right there? Is that good? Or we need to go higher? More volume? Good. All right. Uh, April 2nd, the Holy Spirit woke me up about 2 a.m. and said, 15 days of faith. And how I knew uh, that that's what he wanted, I just did it. And I, I just, I began teaching 15 days. That day we started 15 days of faith. And he showed me out of Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 through 3, that there are six basic doctrines that our Christianity is founded on. And if we don't know those six, we're not even off the milk of the word yet. We might think we are, but we're not, not according to the Bible. But if we can get these six down, we can move on. Well, maybe click on that first one right there. Because it's actually... Uh, yeah, and then come right here and hit that. Click it. Uh, the, the one, yeah, there we go. No, that one, yeah. Okay. This is the overview of all 15 days of faith. Let's pray. <laughs> Lord, thank you for this wonderful evening that you've given to us. Thank you that um, you're going to help us understand more of what we believe and more of what we should believe and how to better put it into practice tonight. And Lord, if there's any particular message that you're wanting to quicken to any one of us or a couple of messages or several, I pray we'll just, just jot that down, make a note. And then we'll be able to communicate that to them, either through the notes or through the videos, or both. Lord, in the ways that this word can go forth and spread and multiply, we desire it to be so. And so if there's others that maybe we think of when we hear these topics, that we could minister to and reach out to with this information, I pray you'd make that happen too. I claim a spirit of understanding in everyone's hearts that's watching tonight, that's here live, that will watch it later on. We claim that done by faith in the name of Jesus. So therefore the enemy can't steal the word from our hearts. And let the engrafted word grow up and bear fruit in our lives. 30, 60, and 100 fold in Jesus' name. Amen. Faith treasures. This is just kind of an overview of what we talked about. The Amplified Bible defines faith a little differently than what you're used to hearing in the King James. In the King James, you're going to hear Hebrews 11 and 1 is the definition of faith. Now, faith is. If it's not now, it's not faith. It's hope. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. 
evidence will convict you in a court of law. Faith is an exact science. It is not a hit or miss proposition. Faith has evidence. Faith has proof. Faith is not ethereal and, woo, you know, mystical. Faith is the Word of God implanted in your heart that causes you to lean your entire personality over on it and act as if it's so, whether you see it with your physical eyes yet or not. The Amplified says that the definition of faith is the leaning of the entire personality on God in absolute trust and confidence in His power, wisdom, and goodness. That speaks highly of our soul's ability to side in with what the Word says versus with what the flesh says. Faith is very involved in the realm of your soul. If your mind and your will and your emotions are not leaning on the Word, it will be hard for you to be in faith. Hebrew, or Luke 18 and 8 was our keystone scripture in this series. Let's turn to Luke 18 and 8 and take a look at that with our eye gate. Remember, we have said over and over and over that there are six foundational truths to our Christianity. The Bible calls them foundational doctrines. Of these six, Faith towards God is number two in the list in Hebrews 6 and 3. Can anybody name any of the other six? Laying on of hands. Can you name another? Resurrection of the dead. Baptisms. Eternal judgment. Okay, which was which is. The first one, and it's called Repentance from Dead Works. Well, there we go. That's it. That's amazing. Give yourselves a hand clap. <laughs> That's awesome. That dog will hunt right there. That's what we say in Tennessee. <laughs> well, of the six, Jesus asks a question that we absolutely must take to heart. He didn't ask it of grace. He didn't ask it of Doctrine of baptism, he didn't ask him laying on of hands. He asked it of faith. In Luke 18 and 8, he says, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? And that's a legitimate question. And that's explaining a lot of what's going on around us in the world today, isn't it? Because part, part of the answer to that question is, 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 is there'll be this atmosphere of faithlessness. Otherwise, he wouldn't have asked the question. I believe because he asked the question, he polarizes everything. So I believe you'll have extreme faith, and I think you'll have no faith. I don't think you'll have as much middle ground as maybe you're used to having. I could be wrong, but I think because he's asking the question, he's polarizing. Some at this end, some at that end. It's like having the no more middle class. <laughs> you got faith upper class, you got no faith lower class. Because Daniel 11.32 and Daniel 12 and 3 tell us that in this generation there'll be those doing extremely amazing things in faith. He says, when I return, will I really find faith in the earth? We said that he's specifically talking about our generation. Because he said in the, in the parable of the fig tree that the generation that sees the fig tree bud or blossom again, and Israel is the fig tree. All through Scripture, Israel is the fig tree. He says the generation that sees them bud or blossom again will be the same generation to see his return. In 1948, Israel became the nation again. They have the distinction of being the only nation in the history of the world to have been a nation, disbanded as a nation, and then become a nation again. In 1967, they got Jerusalem back from the Gentiles. So depending on where you place the beginning of that generation, the budding and the blossoming, either in 48 or 67, 
the clock started ticking. Tick, tick, tick. And, and then there's this great debate of how long a biblical generation is. Some said it was 40 years. We know that's not true. Even if you use 1967 as the choice, that would have been 2007 when he would have returned and it didn't happen. We're still here. Some have said it was 52 years because if you average the, 14, the three sets of 14 generations from Adam or from Abraham to, to David, from David to Jesus, and et cetera, et cetera, then it averages 52 years per generation. If that's true, and you start in 67 and you go 52, you're talking about 2019. Not too far away. If you're going to do something for the Lord, you might want to get started on that. I personally don't know. I can't see where it's longer than 120 years. Some have said it was 80 because of Moses lamenting in the Psalms and man's three, you know, 70 to 80 years, blah, blah, blah. You've heard that before. I don't see how it could be longer than 120. He told Noah in Genesis 6 and 3, I'm numbering man's days at 120. So if you took 120 and you started at 67, you're talking about 2,000 in 87. And it's already 2013. You're talking about 74 years to get it done. You start in 48 and you go to 120. You're talking about 2068. That's 55 years. Either way, you better hit it and get it. Like my mama says, make hay while the sun shines. Whatever the Lord's telling you to do, do how valuable is the oxygen, is the air you're breathing, knowing you're the last generation? Think about it. There isn't any, there's nobody coming after you. This is it. This is it. So we talked about those kinds of things, about the importance of having faith and exercising faith. We said that faith rests. There is a rest of faith found in Hebrews 4. And in the word, the word rest in the Greek actually leans itself towards colonization. Now you think about that. You extend your faith for something from God. Now it's colonizing everything that has to do with that thing you're believing God for. And if you're not sure what colonization means, just look at the British Empire. It used to, the sun never used to set on the British Empire. They colonized everybody. And it's been a major tenet in human history. Whether you agree or disagree, it happened. But faith colonizes. Faith takes over when faith is allowed to. Um, we also saw that inside of faith is, is, is all the army and all the soldiers you need in the DNA of faith to fight all the battles you need fought. When you release faith, you release warrior soldiers to go and put down and depose thrones and kingdoms that stand in your way. It's no wonder the Bible says that our faith is the victory that overcomes the world. That's why he wants to keep you out of church. That's why he wants to keep you from hearing the word of God, which is what they're supposed to be talking about in church. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. So he didn't want you around hearing the word. Because if he can get, get you away from it, he can get your faith. We say this in Tennessee, he can get your goat. <laughs> Don't let the devil get your goat. We talked about how faith frames generations and inherits promises. In Hebrews 11 and 3, and Hebrews 6 and 3, and subdues kingdoms in Hebrews 11 and 33. Faith will cause you to settle down. My friend, if you are not at rest in your soul right now, you're not in faith. Faith, rest. 
I didn't mean circumstances changed. I didn't mean problems disappeared. Faith rests regardless. Just look at Jesus in the back of the boat asleep on a pillow. And brother, it was whoosh, swirling all around him. How do you get to the place of rest? You got to work. What? You got to put the work in to get to rest. And what is your work? Whatever's got you uneasy, whatever's got you upset, you got to get in here and get Bible educated. What does the Word say about your situation? And you do the meditating, the speaking, the thinking, and the acting. And the rest of faith will take you over. It'll start with colonizing you and your mind, will, and emotion. It'll say, sit down there, little buddy boy. It's going to be more than all right. Oh, my gosh. I just want to go back and do 55 days of faith. We discovered that once you get over into faith, God forgets about when you weren't in faith. And if you don't believe me, look at faithful Abraham. Are you kidding me? Abraham tried to pawn his wife off twice to save his own neck. He, he, he got his handmaiden pregnant trying to help God out. And they're still fighting today. Ishmael and Isaac. That's just the front page of the newspaper. That's a bunch of cousins up there in the Middle East fighting. That's because Abraham got a good idea. You know the problem is with a good idea, it's got one too many O's. <laughs> but if you'll, if you'll read what, the, what God says about Abraham, He says He's faithful Abraham. Because once Abraham got over into faith, God forgot all about his doubts. You can change your story, friend. We, we, we talked about that last night in our faith confession. Jehovah the story changer. You can change the way people remember you. There is a force of faith. I'm not saying everybody will forget. I'm not saying that there aren't, you know. But I'm telling you, you can change your image. You can change your legacy. You, the memory of the righteous is blessed. It's not just talking about prevention from Alzheimer's. It's talking about the way people remember you. By getting over into faith. Zephaniah 3, 16 through 20 in summation says, I've appointed you for praise and fame in every land where you've been forsaken and ashamed. And just because you've been forsaken and ashamed doesn't mean they were all wrong. Might mean you weren't in faith. Might mean you weren't acting right. But once you get right, he's got praise and fame for you. Right there in those places. He can erase memories. He holds the king's heart in his hand. He turns it with us in every direction he wants. He has the power to forgive and to forget. When a man's ways please the Lord, even his enemies are at peace with him. Without faith, it's impossible to please the Lord. So once you go over into faith, he'll make your enemies at peace with you if you didn't give a chance to. We, we saw that God appeared nine times to Abraham to reaffirm to him the original word that was spoken to him. If you need a visitation from God, He has those available to reaffirm your faith. We said that faith as a mustard seed can make anything that is impossible, possible. In other words, if your ability to use your faith is as small as a mustard seed, nothing will be impossible for you. So you don't have to be this master, expert, perfectionist, ninja, faith warrior to do impossible things. It's great if you want to be. Shoot for it. Let that be your goal, ninja, faith warriors. But he says, if you just learn to use your faith as small as a mustard seed, you'll move any mountain that's in your way.
We said that the just shall live by faith. We said that we walk by faith. We stand by faith. Anything that's not a faith is sin. That means anything. All means all and anything means anything. So if he says, when I return, will I really find faith? We have a whole lot of self-inventory to do, don't we? Because we might be thinking we're in faith, but actually not be. We have to measure our lives against the backdrop of the Word. Not with this Yehu over here, and Brother Billy Bob over there, and Sister Bucket Mouth over there, and Pastor Disaster, and Church Pros and Chosen. you got to measure it with the Word. You can die in faith. Or you can die in doubt. Personally, I'm leaving in faith. There is what's called the gift of faith. We talked about the gift of faith. The gift of faith has no time constraints. If you need the gift of faith to last you for 40 years, it will. Just ask the children of Israel. The gift of faith is the supernatural ability to receive a miracle from God. It is the highest of the power gifts. It begins where your faith ends. Faith comes. Now faith is already on the scene. I don't want you to think that faith has got to come down the street visiting your neighbor and then show up. Once you start hearing the word. The Bible says the word of faith is near you in your heart and in your mouth. Faith comes alive as you hear the word. We spent some time last night talking about the importance of giving what to the word of God? Voice. Very good. you got to give voice to the word. That's why it's good to meditate, but it's even better to speak what you're meditating. To make it your own. Make it the way you would say it. Faith is, is used in saving the sick. An aspect of faith is calling those things that be not as though they were. But that's easy to do if you've built an inner image in your heart of what the thing is you're believing God for. Once you can see it in here, it's easy to call it into being. Because you can see that what's natural is not lined up with what's spiritual. And so you realize that what's natural was created by what's spiritual. So what's spiritual has authority and first dibs on what's natural. So it ought to be, it ought to be, it ought to be as common to you calling natural things out of the way and spiritual things into existence as putting on your clothes in the morning. If it's difficult for you, we've got some work to do. No. God, men and women, walk that way, talk that way, live that way, stand that way, die that way, because their Father is that way. He said, let there be light. There was no light, but as soon as he spoke it, there was. Light said, oh, I'll be. <laughs> And it's been for 6,000 years off of one word. How powerful is the word coming out of your mouth when you exercise faith in it? Well, it's just as powerful for you as it is for him. And we spent some time on this one because we really need to reaffirm this truth in our spirits. Our faith works or operates by the love of God. Galatians 5 and 6 tells us that. If your faith is not working for you, check up on your love walk. And it really has to do with three different angles. How's your love for God and how's your acceptance of His love for you? How's your love for yourself and how's your love towards your other brothers and sisters and, and those that persecute you and despitefully use you? Gotta got walk walk on that, work on that love walk. 
And we can't say that it's hard or impossible because Romans 5 and 5 says that he shed abroad that very love that causes faith to work. He shed it abroad in our hearts when we received the Holy Ghost. We said that, that faith is humble, which is another aspect of love. You can't have hope, or you can't have faith if you don't have hope. And you definitely aren't getting anything for your faith if you're not walking in love. We have all been given the same measure of faith, Romans 12 and 3. But your ability to use that measure of faith may be as different as there are stars in the sky. You may have a great capacity to exercise faith for finances. But when it comes to healing, you might as well go and hang out in the hospital every day because you just, uh, just can't get it. And that probably has everything to do with what you've heard and seen and done. Or vice versa. You may have tremendous ability to receive your healing and stay in good health. But man, if a bill comes due, you're on every prayer chain, you've emptied every bottle of oil, you're on your face wearing your knees out, because you're not just quite there yet in terms of receiving financial wealth and blessing. But it works the same either way. Faith is faith. Now it seems like it takes longer in the financial realm because he fights you harder in the financial realm. Because see, you have to depend on people for finances to come. And you have to depend on God using people to get finances to come unless he chooses to use a bird or something like with Elijah and the ravens. Healing and salvation, you don't need another human on the earth. Right there you can get saved, I did. Right there you can get healed, I did. But so when you start talking about finances, even if you're self-employed, you still has to use other people to get it to you. Does that make sense? And not everybody is real sensitive to obedience to the Lord in finances. So you're going to have to stand maybe a little bit more in terms of receiving financial blessings by faith. Talk about that. Don't you wish you'd been coming in April? <laughs> we talked about the testing of our faith. Should we just skip that one? Uh, we talked about your faith can change the will of the devil. You're not at the mercy of the devil. You can change his will if you'll exercise faith. And the scriptures, 1 Peter 5 and 9, for that one. We talked about saving faith. We talked about how to increase our faith. Let's go there now. Look at Luke 17 and 5. Well, you're already there if you're, if you're in the book of Luke. I love this, this, this little nugget of truth. My pastor in Knoxville pointed this out some years ago. It says, and the, uh, if you go to verse 1, it says, Then he said to the disciples, it is impossible that, that no offenses should come, but woe to him through whom they do come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. <laughs> and if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. And the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. Now these are the same fellows that was walking on water, casting out devils, healing the sick, raising the dead. And the first time he talks about forgiveness, they said, Lord, increase our faith. <laughs> we are we just like that? Why are we just like that? But then he goes on, he says, he says in verse 6, If you have faith as a mustard seed, you can stay to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots, and be planted in the seed, and it would obey you. Which of you, having a servant, I just heard the word gossip. I want everybody in this room to say this with me. I want you to say gossip. Gossip. Be plucked up. Be plucked up. Be planted into the sea. Be planted into the sea. Don't ever rise again. Don't ever rise again. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 
Then he says, and it seems like to some he changes subjects, but he's on the same subject of increasing their faith. He's telling them how to increase their ability to use their faith. He's telling them to talk to mulberry trees, things that don't particularly have lips, but still have a voice. you got to talk to things that are talking to you, whether that they got lips or not. Your circumstances talk to you, don't they? Relationships talk to you, don't they? Dreams and aspirations talk to you. Depression talks to you. Anxiety talks to you. You've got to talk to things that talk to you. And if you don't, it won't get done. Unless he just does some divine miracle. Verse 7, In which of you, having a servant, plowing or tending sheep, I thought everybody was poor that he talked to. These people have servants. He means meek. Means me. Will say to him when he has come in from the field, Come at once and sit down to eat. But will he not rather say to him, Prepare something for my supper, and gird yourself and serve me till I have eaten and drunk, and afterward you will eat and drink? Does he think that servant because he did those things that were commanded him? I think not. So likewise, when you have done all those things which you were commanded, say we are unprofitable servants, we have done what was our duty. He's telling you that faith is your servant. Put your servant to work. Remember earlier we talked about faith colonizes because faith rests. Get your faith out there working for you. Put it to work. Give your faith something to do. Tell it where to go. Tell it what to do. Be very unemotional about it. Be very businesslike about it. And put it to work. How do you do that? It starts with releasing it out of your mouth. It starts with meditating in the Word, storing it up in your heart, and when something arises, notice it always arises. Why? Because it comes from hell. <laughs> and you want to put it down, then you start to speak your pain. And then let it be. Let your words work. Look, turn to Daniel chapter 10. I'm going to give you an example of this. Daniel chapter 10. This is totally not in the notes. And you who are here tonight are hearing what we didn't tell them in April. So I guess there are benefits. Daniel chapter 10. Verse 2. In those days I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant bread, nor meat or wine came into my mouth, nor... Did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled? Now on the 24th day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, that is the Tigris, I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose waist was girded with golden fogs. We go on, and he falls out in the spirit, and look at verse 11. And he said to me, Daniel, man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for I have now been sent to you. While he was speaking his word to me, I stood trembling. Then he said to me, Do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard. And I have come because of your words. He put his faith to work. It brought angels on assignment. Turn to Acts chapter 10. If you won't put your faith to work, now you know why your life seems so unimportant. <laughs> now you know why things aren't getting done. You've got a workforce. You don't even have to hire them. They work for free for you. What did he say in Isaiah? Come by and eat without money or price. Acts chapter 10, verse 1. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian Regiment, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. He's put his faith to work through his praying and his giving. About the ninth hour, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. 
When he observed him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? So he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging with Simon, a tanner whose house is by the city. He will tell you what you must do. Another translation says, He will tell you words. Put your faith to work. Let it bring angels to you on assignment. Go to Malachi 3.10. We might do a study on faith and angels before very long. Malachi 3.10 says, Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and try me now, or test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. Why of all the names of God that he could have used, and we've got a poster filled with all of them back there, why did he use the word Lord of hosts in association with the tithe? Never thought about that. What's he the Lord of hosts of? What, what are the hosts of? Midgets? Ponies? Cats? Dogs? Angels. When you tithe, which is an act of faith, when you give offerings, which is an act of faith, there is a spiritual release at that moment. And angels are sent on assignment to bring the past. They have gone to work for you. To bring to pass the words of this book. Let's see what some of those things are. Let's see what some of the things your faith will do. Let's see some of its responsibilities. It says, um, see if I will not throw open to you the windows of heaven. So immediately a huge angel goes north and starts cranking on a crane. <laughs> if you've not been wanting to tie, you might have to wake the angel up on the other side of the window Dude, wake up, man. She, they tied. She, wake up. Wake, I'm trying to crank. Would you get, wake up and hit the button, please? And pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. So then he starts dunking stuff like Santa Claus down the chimney. Just dunking stuff. I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. Somebody goes over, grabs the devil by the throat, and cocks him right in the face. Knocks him out cold for seven days. See if you'll come by again on the next day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Nor shall he destroy the fruit of your ground. So things you've been working on, things that bring increase to your life, plans you've been making, will come to fruition. Instead of little birds laying there in the tomato eating all of them, they'll belong to somebody else's tomato. Through your ground, come on. There's plenty of sinners around here to eat their tomatoes. Be mine. Be tired. <laughs> Nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field. So if you got peas coming up, we won't be eating your peas either. And all nations will call you a delightsome land. So now angels will be out there telling birds. Don't they look blessed of the Lord? I don't know the Lord, but that sounds good to me. You look blessed of the Lord. Look at how nice you dress. Look at how nice you drive. Look at how nice your church is. Look at how nice your clothes are. Look at how nice you are. You just look blessed. And all of that's happening because angels are putting a beat down on anything in your way. Lead them down. And there's two angels for every devil in anyway. So it's not that difficult. Your faith will go to work for you if you'll put it to work. Obedience is faith. Now, with that said, that'll work on offerings too. Well, turn to Luke 6.38. This is how to increase your faith for finances. Luke, Luke 6.38 says, lick, six thirty eight. lick it up, yeah. Uh, Luke 6.38 says, give, and you got to do that by faith. 
and it shall be given to you a good measure pressed down, shaken together and running over, will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. Why? Because you go out there and enforce it? No. Because your faith goes to work. Your measuring faith goes to work. Whatever you measured out, however much you felt it, however much it moved you, it moved the Lord a hundredfold. And he says, okay, that widow that cast in all her living, well, she ain't going home road. If I got to go over there and pull it out and hand her that big gold thing, if that fellow threw in his exit, so she can go home and have a heart. Or whatever. Because angels, the Holy Ghost, went out there and enforced this covenant. Because by faith you gave an offering. You put your faith to the test. You, did, you, did I just say that you put your own faith to the test? Aren't you tired of other people testing? Why don't you test it? See if it works. I, I, I want to pray for a man in Africa right now. I'm going to be, obey the Lord right now. His name is Ephraim Shaw. He's the bishop with the Church of God. And he's a mentor to me. He's, he's easily in the 70s. And he's, uh, he's the Spirit of God just quickened his name to me right now. I just want to pray for him. Is that all right? Well, Father, we lift up Ephraim Shawa, Bishop Shawa to you, and his wife, Margaret, and their family. I thank you, Lord, for Arthur, his son, and his family. Yeah. Lord, we just speak a special blessing of protection, a hedge of protection upon him right now. Lord, according to Psalm 91 and 10, do that. Let no evil befall them. Let no plague come near their dwelling. According to Psalm 5 and 12, we surround them with the shield of faith. Have favor and faith in Jesus' precious name. We bind the devil from interfering in their lives in any way, shape, or form. And we just speak peace for their situation. We declare peace in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, come on now, where's my cricket thing? Can you touch that mouse? Just, just click the screen right there. Left click it. There we go. Uh, we talked about having a like-minded faith. You know, you can be around people that don't have the same faith as you. And it can be difficult. Amos 3.3, 3, how can two walk together unless they be in agreement? We talked about the law of faith. We talked about having faith like a soldier. We talked about Jesus being the author and finish of our, of our faith. We, we came away with this conclusion. That in the course of a single solitary day, that the goal of God in our individual lives is to position us in situations that require the greatest use of our faith that loves at the deepest level the most people. And that ought to clear up any confusion of what's going on in the course of our day. Well, why is it this way? Why do I feel so picked on? Why is that so impossible? Well, it might not be the devil. It might be God just enforcing the law of faith. Developing your faith. Being the author and the finisher of your faith. Stretching you. That's what he's going to do today. That's what he's going to do tomorrow. And then he'll be doing, on that next week and next month, he'll be doing just what? The same thing. Now, the antithesis of this is the devil. And so he's going to, every single day, Attempt to manipulate, coerce, coerce, run over, intimidate, cause the confusion, to put you in situations and circumstances that require the greatest amount of fear, that exercise the most amount of doubt that can possibly have. As unloving to the most amount of people, you possibly could be unloving to. And that will be what he'll be doing today. Tomorrow, next week, next month, and next year. And you're standing in the middle. What's the choice? Where will you?
you turn. And we, we, we learned that from our 15 days of faith. I had never heard that said before. So I felt privileged that God would share that. And like my eyes for that. So I, I, I might be going through some things, but I'm not, now I'm not wondering why. There's no confusion as to why it, life is the way it is. Okay. That right there is a huge load off your mind. And you can just understand, oh, well, this is either the devil trying to do that or God trying to do that. Now I've got a choice to make. Who am I going to side in with? Faith or fear? Love or hate? Hope or doubt? We talked about the different types of faith that the Bible talks about. It talks about perfect faith. That's actually the word mature faith. Ephesians 3, 17 through 19 is our scripture for that. We talked about being full of faith. If you can be full of faith, you can be what? Empty. Or half full, or half empty, however you look at it. We talked about great faith. Great faith has to do very much with submission to authority, perseverance, and humility. Because the two examples that he told had great faith, both were Gentiles. The woman from Canaan, whose daughter was grievously vexed with the devil. And then the Roman centurion who says, I'm not even worthy for you to come under the roof of my house. And he told both of them by the time they finished talking that they had great faith. And we, we looked at that. We might have to do that one again. I just have to put it on the spirit to go look at that one again. Great faith. Say this with me. I have great faith. In Jesus' name. Now, uh, Beware of religious doctrines that suffocate faith, making it little or hesitant. Because we talked about little faith. And little faith, if you'll study it out, is hesitant faith. You know what faith is, but you're hesitant to do it. So you have little faith. You're dealing with obedience. Okay. We also showed that great faith has to do with love, which just stands to reason. But in both instances that he said they had great faith, they were exercising faith for someone besides themselves. And in the Roman centurion's case, it was for someone that could have easily been replaced. He wasn't even his son. He wasn't even a relative. He was his servant. And he was a Roman, which means he was brought up in a culture that would shoot you just as soon as look at you in terms of military and might and rule and dominion. You know, they conquer people everywhere. What's certain? You get five more just like it down the street. But this one, he didn't want to lose. This one, he's loving like a son. Proverbs says if you treat your servant like that, he'll be a son to you. When he gets older, when he wants to be. So great faith has to do with selfless love. Sure does. Do you want us people to say you have great faith? Then have great selfless love for other people. And God will make sure you get your stuff done. He'll make sure you get taken care of. For God so loved the who? The world that He gave. Didn't even have himself on his mind except to die. Send his most precious son. Uh, we talked about being strong in faith. Standing firm. Bearing with the weak. How to treat people with weaker faith. We just slap them around, make fun of them, talk about their mama. No. There's a way to handle people that are, that are weaker in faith. I was very convicted over this message. It really spoke to me. Calm down and slow down. In the way that I treat others. We talked about how some just need a good rebuke to get up in faith. The Bible says carefully concealed love. Or it says open rebuke is better than carefully concealed love. 
There does come a time when you just need to jack slap somebody in love and get them to get up and get going. You can do better than you're doing. No condemnation, conviction from the Holy Spirit. You're not doing all you know to do. We talked about churches were made strong in faith. We talked about increasing faith. We talked about increasing the sphere of influence through the exercise of your faith. He told the Thessalonians their faith is showing remarkable growth. We talked about unfeigned faith. We talked about weak faith. Hesitation of consciousness, motives and actions. We talked about uh, using our faith to become all things to all people to win some. We talked about not being a stumbling block to the weak or strengthless. We talked about bearing with the weak. We talked about childlike faith. There's little faith, no faith, dead faith, and vain faith. Pretty good overview, isn't it? If you want the notes, see me after. All right. Uh, let's click off of that now. And uh, does anybody need to take a break? Anybody need to hit the head? Use the restroom. Anything, or we just keep going. All right. Um, let's click off right here and right there. Uh, right there. Yeah. Click, click off that one because we're going to go into 15 days of revelation. Uh, click off of that one and then let's click right here and then right there. All right. Uh, Click on that one right there. And then right here. Yep. There we go. That is so easy right there. Now, in our 15 days of Revelation, we, we were doing a hybrid of the last two six doctrines in Hebrews 6. Eternal judgment and resurrection of the dead. But rather than call it 15 days of eternal judgment, I thought it might be more cosmetic to call it 15 days of revelation. Where are you going tonight to get eternally judged for the next 15 days? <laughs> Probably not going to draw too many people. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Revelation. It's not Revelation. It's Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. A couple of things that we pointed out in those 15 days... Uh, the title of the book, The Revelation of Jesus Christ, which is where you're going to find a lot of these things on end times and eternal judgment. This book is loaded for bear with those two documents. What a wonderful insight. This book reveals Jesus Christ to us greater than any other book in the Bible. And yet, most folks think that it's all about the Antichrist, the judgment, the beast, and hell. Those things occur in that book, but the book is mostly about Jesus. And you'll find in the chapters, particularly when he's talking about the seven churches, key phrases that highlight Jesus for you as he is right now today. Not hanging on the cross, not a baby in a manger. Not ministering to the multitudes. But what does he look like right now? And with that said, turn to verse 12 of chapter 1. And we'll read a little bit about that. John says, now to set this up, John is on the Isle of Patmos, just off the Greek coast. They've tried to boil him in oil to kill him, and he just took a bubble bath. And so they stuck him on an island with a bunch of prisoners to get rid of him. Well, on the Lord's Day, he was in the Spirit. He was having church in prison. And the Holy Ghost took him up. And showed him, and if you'll notice where Patmos is, it's right across the aisle from the seven churches that he describes. It's like he had a periscope 
into their windows and could watch them having church. The Spirit took him up and showed him what was going on. I, I'm going to show you one more thing while we're on this. This is something they didn't get. Turn with me to first, Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians chapter 4. Excuse me. Chapter... No, 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 no. First Corinthians chapter 5. First Corinthians chapter 5. Just, just, just a nudge. Just obeying the nudge here to show you something. We have another message that we've not preached in probably in a year and a half entitled, Is Your Conversation in Heaven? Anybody ever heard that message from up here before? Somebody else might have preached it, but have you heard us do it? Probably time to do it again. That may be what I preach when I get back. Remember we said the word conversation is also a manner of life. Well, look here in 1 Corinthians 5 and 4. Paul is talking to the Corinthians about someone who's committing some sins. And Paul is writing this letter, I believe, from Rome, if I remember correctly. And he says, um, In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now that sounds cutesy, but he's actually saying, guys, in my spirit, man, I'm inside your services, and I perceive that this was going on. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and look at verse 1. I'll show you a little clear what I mean. Just kind of give you the aha, the possibility thinking. John was in the spirit. On the Lord's day, and the Lord showed him seven churches and their behaviors. Well, Paul saw the Corinthian church and their behaviors before John had that happen to him. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 1. It is doubtless not profitable for me to boast. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or whether out of the body I do not know, God knows such a one was caught up to the third heaven. I know such a man, when, and, and, and it's common belief that he's talking about himself, he's just being humble. Um, how he was caught up into paradise and heard, verse 4, inexpressible words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one I will boast. Well, turn over to Colossians. And uh, look at chapter 2, verse 5. For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. Now seriously, how is he beholding their good order? But he's talking about I, whether they're in the body or out of the body, I don't know. But I walked in on your services the other day. And I saw your good order. And the steadfastness of your faith that I want to brag on a little bit. Now we might do it through Skype. Or a, a, a phone call. Somebody tell you about it. Back then, they didn't have that. They just did like Philip did. They were transported in the spirit from one place to the next. Turn with me to John chapter 3. I'll show you Jesus. You know, you can be bigger on the inside than you are on the outside. A whole lot bigger. Your spirit is remarkably underrated. Underrated in terms of power, ability, knowledge. It's extremely underrated. John 3, there was a man of the Pharisees, verse 1, named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, 
Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of the kingdom of God, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher, the teacher of Israel, and you do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify, what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things, now he said being born again was an earthly thing. If I have told you earthly things, see that's the, the doorway, that's the entrance. There's so much more. We talked about that in terms of the Holy Ghost baptism too. You know, some preach salvation like it's all there is. Jesus says that's an earthly thing. He says, if I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? And then just to prove the point, Notice the next verse. No one has ascended to heaven but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man who is in heaven. Now i got a question for you. Who's the Son of Man? Jesus. Where is he standing when he tells him that? Physically, where is he standing? On earth. On earth. But where did he say he was? He said he's in heaven. He's a man walking between two worlds. Go, go to... Um, Philippians 3.20. Now this is the New King James, but the King James is going to say it a little differently. And this says, for our citizenship is in heaven. But in the King James it says, for our conversation is in heaven. Do you remember Jesus up on the Mount of Transfiguration talking to Moses and Elijah? I dare say that's not the only time that type of thing happened in this prayer life. What did the Bible say? If we wrote down everything he did? Well, how else do you explain? This is how I think it happened. I mean, you can't prove it or disprove it. But he goes up into this mountain to pray. He tells them to cross over to the other side. He's up there praying. He's off in the spirit like this. He's between heaven and earth. And he gets done praying. Or maybe he doesn't. Maybe he just realizes, well, I, I don't want to be so heavenly minded. I'm no earthly good. I did tell him to cross over. I need to go meet him over there. But I'm not done talking. So he just takes off talking to the Lord. And all of a sudden he looks down and notices, oh, there's water down there. Oh. And he goes on. And he passed the boat. But they called to him. He's like, oh, oh, there's some bad things. I told him to cross that over. And Peter says, Lord, if it's you, well, who else is there? Bid me come on the water. Jesus is so anointed. You know, we talk about Peter's shadow. Jesus is so anointed. The anointed reached over and tickled Peter under the chin and said, How much did you ask to go out there? Yeah, because he's thinking that thought every day, right? Every day he's thinking, I'm going to walk on that water. I'm tired of fishing, he's going, I'm going to walk. The anointing, you, you get up under the anointing like you need to be, and you'll start having thoughts that you don't normally have. You'll start seeing heaven invading your possibilities again, and you'll start stepping up doing stuff that. Like, well, I hung around that other crowd. We didn't, we didn't think like that. But this crowd right here, they think it's possibility things. They think miracle things. Unusual manifestations. So, so Jesus' anointing, his sphere of influence, his circle, is 50 miles wide <laughs> as he's walking. You've heard of revival stories of Sister Mary Woodward Edder, where they'd have a revival in one city and people 50 miles away fell into the power in their living room. Didn't even come to me. Didn't even get under the temple. Over and over it happened. Entire towns had closed down. Wigglesworth on a train. On a boat, people walk up to him. Never said a word to him. You can fix me. And he just dropped to the knees and said, I will say it again so you hear me. 
your spirit man is vastly underrated. Vastly. You know, you gotta do is get your mind to shut up and listen and conform to what your spirit already knows. What you, 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 have you thought about it? You ever had a good roommate in college or sometime before? Somebody good that lived with you? And how awesome it was? Your roommate is the Holy Ghost. Your spirit man is that is where the Holy Ghost is. And we want to spend all this time doing what our minds do. And the whole time the Holy Ghost is living with our spirit. Going, you can do that. What does it make sense? I'm not telling him to shut up up here. Take a broomstick and pound on the floor and tell him to shut up. Make too much noise, all that. Back to the belfry. And just go. So Peter gets out on that anointing, on that word. Get the faith in the working of miracles right there. Happening right there by the Holy Ghost. And Jesus rebuked him for having little faith once he started to sing. What does that say about the one still in the boat? Can't criticize Peter until we got out there. He did walk. And then he got close enough where Jesus could grab him. You know, he's off from the boat. I, I don't tell this story all the time, but he's telling me to tell you. I've told four stories to get out of doing it, but I'll tell you. I was asked to minister in a church in Seymour, Tennessee, in 2009. 2008, excuse me. Somewhere in there. I'd never preached in this church before. And it's really when God first started opening up churches for me to minister in pretty regularly, consistently. You know, I tell people I've been faithful in my home local church for 12 years. Then doors started opening. I, I missed one service a year in my church. Maybe. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. And then involved in all kinds of health ministries during the week. So usually there once two other times. I think those kinds of things, I think that paying the price opened up stories like what I'm about to tell you to happen. I think you, there's an exchange. If you're faithful in that, he'll make you ruler over that. And so uh, I spend time praying in the Spirit before I minister in a church to get the mind of the Lord. I mean, I have an idea of what I think maybe should happen, but I always say, hey, Lord, is there anything in addition to it? Is there anything you want to replace? Or should I just trust that you're going to blow my mind either way? <laughs> well, it's about midnight. And all of a sudden, I found myself hovering over the bed of a couple that I knew was coming to the service the next day. And they were arguing, fully close, sitting on top of the bed. I don't think I'll keep the bedroom. But I'm hovering over the, over the bed there. And I hear the Holy Spirit say, Tell her, I said, to just drop it, that the past is the past. And tomorrow in service, tell her. And I said, Well, Lord, sure as I give her a word, I'm going to need to give him a word. Because you know how that works. He says, Tell him Isaiah 40 31, I'm about to promote him. That'll be a blessing to you. They that wait upon the Lord shall mount up. So the next day in service, I was teaching on gifts of the Spirit, prophecy or something, and just casually there sitting there, and I said, like, for instance, last night, I was hovering over your bed, and the Spirit of God told me to tell you to just drop it, that the past is the past, and that you're about to get a promotion. And I went on past it and kept going. Well, after the service, they pulled me to the side and said, what were those verses you gave? What? Tell them again? They said, do, do you realize... That the very exact moment at midnight, when you said you were hovering over our bed, and we were arguing, and you said, I said to tell you to drop it. Those are the exact words that we were saying at that exact moment. I said, well, of course it was. I was there. I saw it. Okay. <laughs> you want me to tell you what else? What you know you said? And, and so I, I gave him that word. They used to live down here. 
they were one of the reasons God connected me down here to begin with, was through that friendship. Well, he was a, an account, he was working for one of the big accounting companies. That marvels hard. And he said, he said, Eric, I, uh, I got an account with one of the pornography companies. And as I'd be working on their stuff, it just popped up on the screen. And he says, over, over a while, that war on me. And then I found myself stopping in these bars on the way home. These popless things that got going on. He says, I never did anything with anybody, but I, I shouldn't have gone and I went and I went in. But he's not told her what I had done. And asked her to forgive me. And this was several years ago. And she, she hadn't done it yet. She just refused to forgive me. Well, they moved to Tennessee and she went out sleeping with somebody that she wasn't married to. Because she didn't forget me. I mean, she might not have put those two things together, but, you know. And he forgave her. And he said, let's just work. They got three kids. Let's, young kids, you know, let's, let's get past this. Just drop it. The past is the past. I don't treat you that way. I don't do that anymore. But it's exactly that Well, he got promoted just a few months later from being a sales associate at a food company to managing his own store. He did such a good job at it. And they began to assign him to other stores that were failing. And he'd go in and just turn it around. Did that twice. Two different cities. Well, I, I wish I could tell you that she needed the word that they are divorced now. And she just kept on with other situations. Uh, a pastor's daughter. He had pastor's kids. Her grandparents were pastors. And, uh, that situation. Because this is, if you never met her, you think she's one of the nicest, it is, one of the nicest people on the planet. They just couldn't get past her. Couldn't get past her. I tried to counsel him for a while, and the sister called me and said, I wish you quit telling me anything. I don't agree with your theology that you tell me. I'd given the sister a word. First time I came down here with that family, she lived on Sunset Point. And I said, You need to make some changes because you don't want to go Ishmael running around here. Well, she tried to rebuke me, you know, a year or two later as I was counseling her. Guess who just had a baby out of wedlock? Yeah, this virgin pastor's daughter. If it wasn't so sober, if it wasn't so great, we could rejoice at God's awesomeness of doing such a mighty move. The fact is, is that there's just no, there's no time for it. People's hearts are so hard. As sure as we're praising God, we go pray for people's hearts. Christian, spirit-filled, virgin, pastors, kids, to get saved in their lives. And there's these mighty, amazing manifestations. It's sobering, isn't it? So anyway, uh, moving right along. John's in the spirit on the Lord's day. Did that make sense to you? We'll come back and do that message sometime. Is your conversation in heaven? Revelation chapter one, verse twelve. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and not from stress and worry, <laughs> but because he's on fire. And his eyes were like a flame of fire, his feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice is the sound of many waters. 
He had in his right hand seven stars, out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. His countenance was like the sun shining in strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, I am he who lives and the dead, behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Write the things which you have said. This is Jesus. This book is about Jesus. End times and eternal judgment is going to start with an emphasis and a focus on Jesus. Resurrection of the dead, we're going to start with a focus on Jesus. So instead of doom and gloom, we teach hope and faith and love and excitement and anticipation. In verse 3, it says, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things to read in it for the time is near. There is a blessing on the book of Revelation that there is not on any of the other books. Now, they don't bless you reading the Bible, whether you read Leviticus or Micah or John or whatever, but on this book, there's a special blessing. If you read it, hear it, and do it. And it's, it's not... This book is written in chronological order. This book is simple to understand. Notice it says there's a blessing on Hebrew reads. It doesn't say, confused, scared out of your mind, run for the hills. It's everyone who reads, hears, and does this book. This book is meant to bless you. Verse 1, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. This book is about the Lord. If you'll read it that way, it'll bless you. And in the context of this, we got over on the seven raptures in the Bible. Now the word rapture doesn't appear in the Bible, but it is an acceptable term summarizing these expressions. Receive unto the Lord, John 14 and 30. Caught up, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. Gathered together with the Lord, 2 Thessalonians 2 and 1. The eminence of Jesus Christ returned, 1 Corinthians 1 and 7. Philippians 3, 20. 1 Thessalonians 1.10, etc., etc. We talked about how soon the Lord's return is. We talked about the timetable. Um, we talked about why is He going to rapture the church. Because some people want to go through the tribulation. Fine. Enjoy. I'll be out of here. <laughs> then we, we named what are the seven raptures. Well, Enoch was the first one. Genesis 5, 21 through 24. And we talked about this the other day. He walked with God and he was not. So if you don't like rapture, just say, I'm going up and there was not. <laughs> Hebrews 11 and 5 is also about him. The second one is Elijah. That's found in 2 Kings 2 and 1 and verses 9 through 11. The third one is Jesus in Acts chapter 1 verses 9 through 11. Why stand, stand ye here gazing up in the clouds? This same one that has gone up is going to come again in like now. The next rapture is us. There have been three, will be four. That's found in Revelations 5, 6, and 7. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 17. 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 55. On and on. Number five, there's a mid tribulation rapture. And that's found in Revelation 7, 9 through 17. Also in there, is the sixth rapture of the 144,000 Jewish virgin evangelists once they get their work done. That's Revelation 14, 1 through 5. And then the last rapture is the two witnesses who were laying dead in the street for several days. Revelation chapter 11, verses 11 through 12. Seven is the number of perfection and completion, and there's seven raptures in the Bible. If you want the notes, see me after this question. Now, let's try this. Let's close this, and let's go back and, and just briefly touch on some of the other things we covered. We're getting it done. Um, just the title here, Did Jesus Go to Hell for Us? That was a question we were asked. I've been asked that question a lot. In fact, I thoroughly offended somebody my first few months down here in the projects witnessing. Apparently they go to a church that absolutely, adamantly opposed the idea that Jesus would have gone to hell for us. Well, if he didn't go to hell, we've got to go. And we, we talked about it. Yeah, he did go to hell. And we talked about what he did down in hell. And 
He did a whole lot of things there in a short time. He scooped up Abraham's bosom, which was next door to hell. Led captivity captive. Put his foot on the devil's necks. Took his keys out of his utility belt. Probably gave him a good kick as he walked away. And he did it openly in front of everybody. Put him to shame in front of everybody. I can see the popcorn now. You know, you can't do a study on end times, eternal judgment, resurrection from the dead, if you don't talk about heaven. And we talked about some of the things that go on in heaven. We looked into, you know, you, if you're going to be there for eternity, you want to spend some time there, might as well find out about it. One of our key scriptures, if you go to Matthew 6 and 10 in that series, was when the disciples wanted to know how to pray, Jesus says, well, pray this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. You want me to say that in old English? Father Uluri, whose they are, Sithing Namat Yehawada, Tobek Kumit in Richi Oneva. That's the English language. Now, that's a few hundred years old, but that's what we used to sound like. Uh, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We talked about the right that we have to pray for days, seasons, months, years of heaven on earth. We looked into that quite a bit last night in that first class, didn't we? Our best year ever. All that comes under the umbrella of that prayer right there. You ever thought about what goes on in heaven? You ever thought about if you just had one day on earth that reflected perfectly what goes on in heaven? If you, if you just got God to do it one day, what would it be like? Well, you have a right to expect that. Well, first of all, there's no sin in heaven, is there? That means you got a day free from people's sin, yours included. It means you didn't worry, didn't doubt, didn't lose your temper, didn't fret. Nothing. What would you do if you didn't do that? We have to have a whole new set of behaviors. Some folks are world-class warriors. What would they do if they ever stopped worrying? Well, there's no sickness in heaven, is there? So you went an entire day disease-free. Well, is there, there's no poverty in heaven, is there? So you went an entire day and had more than enough to do what he had asked you to do. That's days of heaven on earth. That's a start. Then you might walk on the water, raise some folks from the dead, pray for some sick people, get some people saved, heal, feel delivered. That'd be some days of heaven on earth. Yeah. He said daily he loads me with benefits. That's some heavenly appointments right there, Psalm 68 and 19. Now, we talked about Jesus. You know, who's the one judging us? Who's the one who first got resurrected. We want to even know about Jesus. There's seven churches of Asia. And if you'll study those churches, you'll find answers to every problem in church you could possibly have. If you'll study them out. Of the seven churches, we discovered that only one of them did Satan defeat in the sense that he called it dead and that was Sardis. He says, you're dead. But he also told them how to come back to life. Too. The other six the devil didn't get. So he's not this all-powerful entity. He's not going to overthrow your church. He's not going to overpower your church. He's a loser. He's the epitome of losing and deception. And we talked about that. All right, let's close that out. There's so much more we can say, but we're covering 45 days of teaching, two hours. Um, let's click here. We talked about the three baptisms in the Bible and the doctrine of baptisms. There's three. Can you name them? Somebody name one. Water baptism. Okay, somebody name another. Holy Spirit baptism. Okay, what's the third one? You're baptized into Jesus upon salvation. 
you got a whole new family you're baptized into when you get saved. We got over on that night talking about the Hebrews Hall of Fame of Faith. Some of your family members. If, you, if you've got, if like, like in your natural family, you know, you might not, you might have some nuts in your tree. You know, there might be people in that tree you just assume disown. I, I made a, a rash mistake one time. I call it a mistake. At the time, I thought I was right. But you know, I've been walking with the Lord for easily 10, 15 years. And I just got tired of suffering through Christmas and Thanksgiving. <clears throat> With nominal Christians at best, backsliders in the end I bought it. I, I bought it. Um, the family on one side of the family, the mom, mom side of the family, they play this white elephant game. You know, or we steal the gifts. You know, you ever play that game? Everybody brings a gift, of twenty dollars, and you got a number, and you've done that gift that game before. I bought a Christian book, and I had an atheist cousin who behind my back went to my grandmother, my aunt, and my mom and just chewed me up for bringing us such a religious book that was not an acceptable gift for anybody who would come as we have a she wound up with it. And it was about it was about leadership for women. And I think that was just the last straw. And so I wrote them all an email. And I explained to them how I felt. I said, I just want you guys to know that first of all, I didn't have the same last name as you, and I just saw you in the course of life. I wouldn't even be your friend. I wouldn't hang out with you. I wouldn't spend time with you. I wouldn't open up my heart to you. We have next to nothing in common except the same last name or blood in our, in our body. And these are holidays that are supposed to be precious. Particularly Christmas, which is supposed to be about the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and we fail to mention Him once, except in the opening prayer of the food, when we glorify ourselves. And if I would even remotely bring Him up in conversation, you would become my company. And I said, I, I choose to not suffer through another holiday like this when I don't have to. I'm me and you're you. I'll seek you whenever I see you. But when and if I'm absent from the holidays now, you know why. And you're not wondering why I'm not there. I I said this to you. And I was done. I was done. I'm talking about a, a majority of people are supposed to be born again. And I just can't stand you here around here just so back to the uniform self. I can't stand it. Not to mention the, the unsaved that we could get saved if we just step up and act like it. Not that I'm aware of. <laughs> but some time went by and I had softened my heart and you know, thought. The letter itself is proof that God was real in my life because at the time I discussed them out. I just told them where I thought they should go and what I thought about them and not spirit any of them. So if you don't like some of the nuts in your tree, you might want to read Hebrews 11 and, and, and see some of the ones you do have. You can replace them with. You don't like your brothers? Well, you got one named David. you got to get to know David. I, I, I've got to know David quite a bit. I feel like I talk to David, you know, in, in a very real sense. By reading his, his stories and his teachings and his life, I feel like he's, he's alive and talking today. Though I've never seen him personally. Isaiah is another one. I'm moving next door to Isaiah, but he likes to hear about I hope they don't sleep in heaven, because I have a lot to talk to Isaiah about. And I take a lot. Samson, Noah, Elijah, Elisha, Rahab, there's another one. God can take your character defect and flaw. 
sanctify it and turn you into a weapon of war. She was a prostitute. She sold out herself. And God sanctified it and she sold out her nation to the Jewish people. Think about it. Got it. Some folks just need to get saved. They'll be all right. She was the straight up you know what. And the Lord sanctified it and turned it towards good. Did you know that? You ever think about that? Who else was he going to get to sell out? But of course it did. She already had that mentality. She already had that will, that frame, that beautiful. Them, there's some real treasures in the Bible. You ought to read some about it. It's a good book. So, we talked about that family you're baptized into. And that was a fun night. That was the night I didn't know it was going to go like it went. I was, wow, I was saving it to last thinking it'd be the worst. <laughs> and it wound up being one of my most memorable times. The Holy Ghost quickened something to me just now. I forgot to tell us. We talked about hell. In 15 days of Revelation. We were talking about heaven, we were talking about hell. Because some will go up, some will go down. We talked about, this is something you might want to remember. People will say, well, if you ever heard anybody say, how, how come God would send so and so to hell? You ever heard that before? Well, God doesn't send anybody to hell. People send themselves to hell. By choosing to refuse His provision for hell. And I'll prove to you that they send themselves to hell. Because God, a faith God, a loving God, made no provision for one single human to go to hell. Well, how can you say that? Well, the Bible says hell enlarges herself to receive her death. Jesus said that hell was made for the devil and his angels. So he made it exactly to the dimensions that would fit one third of the fallen angels and Satan himself. And no bigger. And so now when a human dies, who he thoroughly anticipated would choose Jesus, and yet did not, hell's got to go and mark itself by one room to receive that death. Because God had no expectation that anyone would be dead. He wouldn't say it. You'll never hear him speak it. You don't talk about no way. So you can just tell people, well, if God sent somebody to hell, how come he didn't make hell big enough to be in there? He made heaven an eternal expense. Because that's how expected he is. But people choose to Jesus. He's got to make it the go where he wants. But he had no thought, no concept in his mind of defeat or failure that anyone would say no. So he did not make hell big enough for one. Well, that brings a question in my mind. It's kind of all well, of course he knows. Yeah. Say no, but he's not going to make provision for it. To do that would be a concession of defeat. Wouldn't it? Yeah. If I, I'll tell you one better. I knew I was getting a surprise birthday party this year. Somebody called me and gave it away. They called and said, I'm not going to be at your birthday party. Huh? I said, I don't think I'm supposed to know about my birthday party. <laughs> Sorry. I'm not going to be there. But I had to act surprised. Because that would hurt people. That's a lot of effort and work we do. Now I knew I was getting a birthday party, but I didn't I didn't make provision to act like I knew. You know, I was omniscient in that sense. But I did it did not affect my behavior one day, nor did I allow it to. And until I said that just now nobody probably knows I knew. But someone, but someone called and said, I can't help. So, anyway, God knows they'll say no. But it's not, it's not going to affect his expectation one little bit. To do it would be a concession of the deed. We talk about his elect. You know, like he chose some to say yes and some to say no. But that right there just proves that. Because he didn't make provision for them in hell to begin with. That he just chose certain ones who would say yes. I'm, I'm going to tell you something else that's underrated. I told you your spirit man's underrated. Your free will is thoroughly underrated. 
Your ability to choose is absolutely one of the most overlooked resources on the planet. God is sovereign. The devil did this. Trent, you need to drop all that and you need to go think on free will. Uh, then we talked about a lot, eight or nine days, we focused in on the baptism with the Holy Spirit. And we got over on the Holy Spirit. We got over on the baptism itself. We got over on the outward evidence of being filled, which is speaking with other tongues. And we looked at 26, well actually we looked at about 30 reasons why every believer should speak in other tongues. Anybody, name one. Name a reason why we should speak in other tongues. It's a way to pray for every Christian simultaneously. That's powerful. What's another one? Praise God's perfect will every time. Romans 8, 26 and 27. Yours was Ephesians 6, 18. What else? Build ourselves up. Jude 20. Speaking directly to God. Talking secrets with our Father. 1 Corinthians 14 and 2. What's another one? Deepen self-discipline. I pray that you would struggle with me. Strive together with me in your prayers. That's what Paul said. What's another one? One more. What is it? Declare God's works. That how it, how be it we hear them speaking in our our tongues the wonderful works of God. Acts chapter one verse thirteen, I believe it is. Pretty good stuff, isn't it? We talked about spirit filled helps ministry. I think one of our first nights. What it means to be a spirit filled helps minister. Everyone is called to minister. Not everyone's called to the five-fold pulpit ministry. Everyone is called to minister. And you can do a better job doing it, filled with the Holy Ghost, than God. We talked about the role of the Holy Spirit in receiving healing. You ever thought about it? The Holy Spirit's role in healing. He's the power behind the Word, isn't He? He's the one making the body better. We talked about what a difference the power makes. What a difference 40 days made in Peter's life. Actually, it's more like 50 days. From, from Passover to Pentecost is 50 days. Peter denied the Lord three times the night before Passover. On the day of Pentecost, just 50 days later, he stood up and led 3,000 people to the Lord. A totally changed man. What a difference the power makes in just 50 days. We talked about that. How many of you were here for that message? What a difference the power makes. You must have been preaching that to Al that night. <laughs> Who and how should I be sharing Jesus with? Who was here for that one? Who should I be sharing Jesus with and how should I be sharing Jesus with? Him? Remember we talked about the three foot rule? Anybody within three feet of you is a candidate for your product or service, that would be Jesus. Healing, salvation, deliverance, discipleship, and filling. We talked about, number one, Ephesians 6, 18 and 19. You pray for bold utterance. Then you pray for the word to have free course, 2 second, second Thessalonians 3 and 1. Then you pray that, it, that you'd have an open door of utterance that that word would have free course, that you'd always be delivered from wicked and unreasonable people. Four infallible steps to win anybody to Jesus. We talked about the prayer to pray for lost people that maybe they won't listen to you, but you can get people to them that they will listen to. And we talked about that. Father, we call so-and-so out of the domain of darkness. I'm going to be obedient right now. It's, it's one thing to hear about it, it's another thing to do it. And it's a piece of faith. Join your faith with me tonight for Ed and Eleanor. Okay? 
head and elbow. Say this with me. Say, Satan, we break your power over Ed and Eleanor. And we call them out of the domain of darkness and into the kingdom of the Son of God's dear love. Angels, go and bring people across Ed and Eleanor's path to minister to them specifically the Word of God concerning their salvation. People they will actually listen to. Qualified to talk to them. In the mighty name of Jesus, we count it done by faith. And now, Lord, by faith, we praise you and we thank you. We give you a shout of praise. For Ed and Eleanor's salvation. Jesus, we thank you. For Ed and Eleanor's salvation. Thank you, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Thank you for their salvation. Thank you, Jesus, for their salvation. I I'm led to share a little testimony. The Spirit of God just quickened somebody's face to me. I, I, I was uh, living in a mobile home community in 2006 or so. And there was an older gentleman that was next, living next door to a home that I was mulching for the owner. The owner was one of my best friends. And uh, he had hired me to mulch the home next to this man. And this older man would have a reputation of being an ornery critter. 76, something like that. And he was sitting on his front porch, and I could just hear him pressing the way as I'm shoveling the dirt. Mulching the dirt. And I thought, Lord, if he can spit his gospel out, I'm going to spit mine. So he hollered over at me. He goes, you do any carpentry work? I said, no, but my boss is a carpenter. So he's Jewish. He said, no. He said, I like Jewish people. They do good work. I said, my boss's name is Jesus. He said, oh. I said, do you know him? I said, he wants to know you. He said, no, I can't say that I know him. I said, would you like to get to know him? He said, tell you a little story about him. And I began to share the story of salvation, the plan of salvation, the 76 year old. He had a Catholic back then. And he prayed with me right then and there. That day he was hard to do this. I said, now you make sure when, you, when your wife gets home that she tells, she's about 80. You make sure you tell her what you did. He said, oh, she's the first person I went there. He said, I think she knows you. He died not long after. But he went to heaven. There's a way. There's a way. We talk about Jesus is the way. We talk about Jesus makes a way where there seems to be no way. Why don't we use that in so many? Why don't we apply that in our way to others to the Lord? There's nobody out of the reach of the Lord. There's nobody too hard. It might not be you doing it. It might be you sending somebody else to do it. Pray to do it. You know, family can be difficult to witness. You should just come in the hospital with me sometimes see if you do yourself. They've changed your diaper. You fought them. You cussed them out. The guy you used to cussed them out. You said something about them when they were 15. And now they're 42. Can't let it go. I have chosen to cease and desist in my witnessing to a certain people last year. Blood will. However, I have taken them before the Father, and I have assigned the Holy Spirit to angels and those that are qualified to talk to them, they will listen to, to harass them to the ends of the earth, so they get their hearts right with Jesus, whether that be salvation or redemption. Jesus needs to go away. 
that he takes it. Rivers in our desert. Pretty good recap, isn't it? Just about there. Just about there. It's been a fun 45 days. Uh, we talked about an outpouring of giving. We talked about the move of the Holy Spirit on the heels. This is, this is worth showing one more time. The Spirit of God says show it one more time. Look at Acts. Chapter 2 and chapter 4. I just, just want to highlight something here. Draw attention to something. Can, can I share a little secret with you? Would it be alright if I shared a Bible secret with you? Hold your finger in Acts 2 and 4 and go to the feet. I want to show you something. If you look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15, it says, Therefore I also, what do you say about the word therefore? After I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love, notice how faith and love all of you are here, for all the saints, not just the one you are, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation from the knowledge of Him, the eyes of your understanding and your life. Now, the Bible says in the beginning was the Word, and the Word became flesh. So this book is God who spoke with Jesus. You might read it five times, you see something different five times. So what I want to share with you now comes from praying this prayer. No one taught me this other than the Holy Ghost. Now, wonderful people have taught me most of what I know through the Holy Spirit teaching me. This was something, the hell thing was something that the Holy Spirit gave me. The faith, you know, this position every day for you, most faith, most most people, that was from the Holy Spirit. And this is from the Holy Spirit. Now, go over to Acts 2, and it, it says in verse 4, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay. Now Peter gives the sermon. That's what the next few verses are. Then, look at 43. Then fear came upon every soul. This is the same conversation. And many wonders and signs were done to the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all and then one had need. Now nobody told them to do that. The Holy Ghost moved sovereignly in response to their giving the Holy Ghost gift. The, the, one of the, we talk about tongues being outward evidence. Giving is another evidence of being spirit filled. Look at Acts 4, verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke word of God told Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power, they gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Great grace was upon them all, nor was there anyone among them who lacked. For all who possessed, who were possessed of lands or houses, sold them, and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold, and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed each one that anyone had need. Giving is a direct reflection, direct result of being filled with the Holy Spirit. But then we talked about in Romans 12 about how you can just be a giver. The Spirit of giving versus having the giving the Spirit. You see, there's, there's a difference. Romans 12, in verse 6, says, Having many gifts. These are not the gifts in 1 Corinthians 12 that are as the Spirit wills. You don't have those gifts. Those gifts come as the Holy Spirit wills. Now, because of a person's call, it may look like they have them because God's willing it all the time. 
we can flow the word of knowledge, the word of wisdom, and we will talk to you. If these are embedded in your born again personality, you have a dominant motivational gift. I believe that's what these are called. They're motivational gifts. They are the motive. They are why you are the way you are. There's, there's, if you'll have maybe some symptoms or tendencies of many of them, but they'll be a dominant one. And, and one of them is given. He says, if it's prophecy, prophesy. Ministry, minister. Teach, teach. Exhort, exhort. Give, give with liberality. No strings attached. It's leading, do it with diligence. It's mercy, do it with cheerfulness. Okay? Now, on the heels of this message, we have the single largest offer that we've ever had in this church during these meetings. Ever. We do. That lets you know you're on the right track. The proof's in the pudding. <laughs> he said he'd confirm his word, the signs of one is following. Then we talked about water baptism, and we talked a lot about John, and we gave John props. We talked about one of the most outstanding characteristics of John is that he turned all his influence over to Jesus. And, 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 and we talked about how often in the book of Acts ministers of God ministering to kings or lowly people would start their dissertation of the gospel with from the days of John's baptism. And we talked about how big a deal water baptism is. Now, we said it doesn't save you, but it sure is big, isn't it? All right. Well, I believe we have thoroughly brought ourselves up to date. We've come as current as we can possibly be. And uh, we've done it in right around two hours. Forty-five days worth of teaching. Um, I'm, I'm getting ready to go on a trip two trips, actually, and uh, I, I, was having, I was having this wild, paradoxical thing to go on. April 2nd was the first day that we started 15 days ago. Then I went on the trip. <coughs> then I came back, and we started 15 days of revelation. Then I went on the trip, came back, and we started 15 days of baptism. <coughs> Over a 72-day period of time, you start April 2nd and go to today. We have done in this church 45 service each. That's almost unheard. You know who that sounds like? That sounds like revival in the land. A revival of the word. Oh. In Lakeland, there was a revival of the spirit. Was there not worship, miracles, praise, signs, wonders? Every day for how long? And I don't really know a whole lot about it. I'm just speaking out of my spirit right now. Are you talking about Brown? The Lakeland area that was. Oh, oh. Some few years ago. Oh, Brown, uh, Rodney Brown. Well, and, and there was another one. Oh, that guy. Okay. Oh, and then even now, with with Dr. Ron Howard Brown, there's this resurgence going on. Well, the Great Awakening. We're in the revival of the word, right? And I'm just realizing we're in the revival of the word. Yeah, we want the spirit. The spirit of the word. They and we've had manifestations and demonstrations of our history. We still don't have one. However, the word is going to change permanently. It's not one or the other. It's not you need both. But I, without even intending to do it, without even purposing in my mind, just right now, this very second, it has occurred to me that we are having a fire of the word of God. How many people? can say, other than Bible school students, that I sat under 45 days 
of teaching of the Word out of the last 72 days. That's then we do regular services as well. You know, 9 30 on Sunday. And he spoke to me when I was still living over on 19, several months ago. Uh, this would have been October. So less than a year ago, he spoke to me that our church was going to experience revival. And we were doing good then. You know. We just got this building, you know. And uh, yeah, I'm so busy. And it just fell on me sitting right here for 45 days of revival of the Lord. And, and there's people here every night. There's never been a night when I showed up to minister and somebody wasn't here. Not one time. I, I could you not in the 45 days of the Not one time. And yet, on the other hand, I've been nothing. I mean, if you were to go tell your friends, I go to a church. And we've had 45 services in 72 days. They think, well, who knows it? And yet, I've been gone every other one of those days, just about planting churches in the world. So you can equally say, I've been gone, but you can equally say, we do a lot of services. This church, and I've done a lot of those services. I've done every one of them. You know, I've been going for me while I was gone. But I've done most of them. I've done 90% of those services. Maybe 90%. Maybe 95%. Maybe 95%. Maybe 95%. Um, so, I would, yeah, we try to revival up the water. That's pretty good, isn't it? I don't think we've ever thought of that. You know? Yeah, you can think of revival. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, pour out the Holy Spirit, bring people to the Lord, but revival of the Word, you know, they had that in place to try new meaning, new life, new insight. Insight, the truth, the search of truth. And what did he say he would do with this Word? Confirm it. With signs and wonders following. In the mouth of two or three witnesses. So we'll expand and we'll grow. I'm going to read you a prophecy the Spirit of God gave me the other day. Out of the book of Micah. It, it's a general word, it's a, it's a logos word, but he quickened it to me as a rainbow word. And I'll leave you with this. Um, and, and I'll go ahead and tell you now my plan, my intention. God will is to be back when I'm leaving either later tonight or for most likely in the morning to minister in Knoxville, one of my spiritual sons' church in the inner city. And I've got a meeting in Louisville, a prayer, prayer service, and then an administrative meeting in Louisville, some advertising for things we're doing here in other places. And then I'll be back, traveling back on Monday to be back here for service, normal service on Tuesday night. I plan to minister Tuesday night, Wednesday night, and Thursday night. Okay? And on the laying out of hands, unless you change it. We'll just continue. We've introduced it already. You know, we're going to go on. Wasn't that good, the laying out of hands that we did all that Father blessing that stuff? And then I've got to go away again for just under two weeks, 13 minutes. And, uh, and then when I get back, we'll just continue on with the 15 minutes. Will you stay on board with us? Will you stay on the ship with us? Tell others. This gives you reprieve to say, let's go get some folks. Let's go take our normal night of teaching and let's go get them ready for services, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. As this progresses on and I find folks interested and qualified to do it, I will probably ask some others to just keep it going even while I'm gone. So you can be here all the time if you want. We'll just preach to the walls fall down. And I've got qualified people to fill in while I'm gone. Sunday morning, both services, and Tuesday nights. Two Sundays, two Tuesdays. I've got people already lined up. Some of you you had, some of you haven't had. And uh 
but, but that's something to remember for you. I, I, I'm just sitting here talking out loud, but I can see just whether I'm here or not. Just, let's just go. Because there's people that, that, can, that can go with this. I've been parted with enough people. I've talked with enough people. They can. So that's why I say God willing, because we may be able to do even more, you know, than I'm expecting. Uh, we'll see. But uh, this is what he gave me the other day. In Micah chapter 4, verse 1. Through verse 7. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills. And people shall flow to it. Now I'm talking about this place right here. I'm talking about this place. And anybody else that wants to stretch out their faith and believe for it. And people shall flow to it. Many nations shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion the law shall go forth, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Doesn't that sound like what we've been doing here already? He shall judge between many peoples and rebuke strong nations afar off. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. But everyone shall sit under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. For all people walk each in the name of his God, but we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. In that day, says the Lord, I will assemble the lame, I will gather the outcasts, those whom I have allowed to be afflicted. I will make the lame a remnant, and the outcast a strong nation. So the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion, from now on, even forever. And he, he gave that to me. Last night was not before last night, I forget. About this, what we're doing here, this place. People assembling, people coming, people being taught, and then not being afraid anymore. And that, that's, that's Bible. That's Bible. That as you're taught, fear leaves. Teaching removes fear. And uh, that's Isaiah and on and on. But that's Micah chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. And then the thing about the outcast in the land, that means they'll be healed. That means people will get, get healed in this place. Physically as well as mentally and emotionally, constitutionally. And, then, and of those that come, he'll make them a strong nation. See, we're not just, we're getting the lost saved. We're getting the sick healed. We're building the way we should be built, centered around the Word. People saying, I hear they teach the Word over there. I'm tired of all the fluff. I want to hear the Word. I want my life to change. I'm tired of three points in a poem. I want to hear from someone who knows the book, who knows the Bible. I want to learn. I'm tired of being biblically illiterate. I want people to say of me, man, they know the word. I'm curious to see how the next few weeks go with you guys as you get out talking to people. The Holy Ghost will position you to have conversations with people to pull out of you what we've been teaching. Because he's obligated to. Because he says my word will bring itself to pass. And the purpose of sowing this word is to get it to multiply. And so you'll just find yourself having conversations with people and they'll just, yeah, there's six things you really ought to know. I just don't understand the Bible. I don't know what I should do. Well, let me tell you six things you need to start with. Let me tell you one thing in particular to begin with. How's your faith? Let's work on your faith. Well, you know, I just wish I had faith. Well, how'd you like to have strong faith? 
how do I just walk through how to have strong faith? Like, let's do it. Let's do it. And that's the Lord. That's when we confirm in this Lord. You'll be teachers now. You'll be disciples of the Word. Not that you have not already been. Not that you have not already been. I'm talking about just a whole other level. Okay? That's my prayer. That's the Word, I believe, for us. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for tonight. Thank you. Thank you for every night. Lord, we give you the praise and the glory for it. We thank you for watching over everything that concerns us, that pertains to us. Thank you for confirming your word in our lives with all signs and wonders following. We thank you for your blood, Jesus. Thank you for seeing them here safely and seeing them home safely. I thank you for the trip that's coming up, the two. We give you the credit for them, Lord, before they even begin. Ephesians 3.20. Exceeding abundantly. We pray over the offering tonight that it would be Ephesians 3.20. Exceeding abundantly. Above and beyond anything we could ask or think or dream. According to the power of work against. We bind the enemy in our lives from all distractions and trying to wear us out and wear us down and intimidate us and bully us and manipulate and coerce and deceive us, accuse and tempt us. We bind him in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. We resist him in faith. We submit to the word of God, and therefore he is fleeing from us seven different directions as if in terror. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Amen. Well, guys, like I said before, uh, we have the opportunity to give by debit card, credit card if you're interested, or checks to the IFCI. And you don't have to give. Lord, we, we're here 15 nights. You know, I understand. <laughs> we're not the only thing in the world going on. But if you're led to give, it's, it's good ground. It'll be a blessing. It's just, you can't have give God. And that's all I'll say. So, otherwise, you're free. And if you need notes of anything, let me know. We'll, we'll try to figure out how to make that happen. I say it that way because if I'm friends with you on Facebook, it's very likely I could just send it to you there. And you can download and copy it. I haven't yet got the printer where it needs to be yet. So I, you know, just ripping it off like that. Or if you have email, I can copy and paste and send it to you that way. Or if you want the links, we can, we've got the messages titled and I can highlight certain ones. So anyway, or if you've got a thumb drive, uh, you know, we can do it that way too. Just transfer it over. Okay? Thank you for coming. Yes, thank you so much. It's uh, ten and a half hours driving. I uh, seem to average about 12 hours once I stop and all that stuff. And then Louisville, we're, we're establishing a you know, one there and uh, start with the first one. Uh, we have a, a meeting September 2nd in the building for some time. Since I'm going to be in Knoxville, close to Louisville, I have a shooter there. One of our members that is coming here uh, has moved to Louisville and we've got a few companies that get set there. So they're still a part of it. So anyway. Well, you have to say, Chris, and we'll be praying for you. And I'll see you guys in the next week. Thank you.